Well, welcome again, everyone. Um, over the past eight weeks, we've been in a series together called Disciple Shift, and we've been asking the question, not just do you believe in Jesus, but how do you become more like him, to be his disciple? And we've studied what a shift in our lives would look like if we made, that's our primary goal, is we want to humbly respond to others and respond to God just the way Jesus did. And so in this series, we've been learning about different areas of life where we apply this. How do we become disciples of Jesus when we face times of grief? How do we do it in a politically divisive climate? How do we do it in the world upheaval that we're seeing around us? And we've kind of applied it in different ways. What does a disciple look like who's humble and dependent on God? Today, I wanna turn our series to another area of life that sometimes I don't think we connect with shifting our lives to be disciples, and that's in our sexual lives, as sexual discipleship. Now, let me just say at the outset, I think for most of us, those two words do not belong together. And we think that because we think, well, sexual is about the physical part of our lives, and discipleship is about the spiritual part of our lives. And so throughout the centuries, Christians have had this tendency for us to separate the physical from the spiritual. And without even thinking about it, we, that's kind of what we are prone to do. We separate theology from biology. And, and so there's this tendency to do that. You see it with early Christians that will be written to in Paul's letters, and we see it today. And we see that there's massive problems when we try to disconnect spiritual from physical. And it can lead to many of us in our day who say, I, I love God, I wanna follow God but we kind of live our lives, if we're honest, like sexual atheists. Where, God, you have most of my life, but this, this part of my life, God, you don't really exist in. Uh, and it's kind of hard to pretend God didn't exist when he's the one who made this and he made you. And, and so that can lead to us becoming our own authorities on our sexuality or cultural messages. It, it can lead to lots of problematic things like sexual repression or unhealthy obsession or isolation and some of the struggles we're facing or confusion about big questions and, and ultimately can lead to plain devastation that some of us have experienced in our lives. And so today I wanna study with you and explore how does a disciple of Jesus really honor God with their sexuality? How do we view our sexuality as disciples? And I wanna highlight that this message is for those of you who say, I wanna be a disciple. I wanna follow Jesus. Because sometimes I know in churches, messages about sex can be given and people sitting in church are hoping that the preacher preaches at people outside of church. And that's not this message. Uh, this message is about preaching to those of us here who would say, you know, I. I, I want to be a disciple. And here's what that means if that's you. That means you're an imperfect person with an imperfect past. You do not have it together. You have sexual brokenness in some way in the way you've thought or the way you've acted. And yet you're saying, I want to humbly trust God with every part of my life. And so that's what we're going to do for a few moments as we dive into scripture. And the way I want to do it might be a little different than what you're going to imagine. I want to do this by asking the question, who is your body for and who is for your body. If you have your Bible with me today, turn to 1 Corinthians 6, where I think Paul addresses this question of who is your body for and who's for your body. And uh, I think these are things that we need to really think about before we come to the question about how we act as sexual beings. Now, sometimes we're not sure what something's for in life. You ever had that where you're like, why, why is that there? For example, you ever wondered why they have those baubles on like winter beanies or like knitted caps? Like, is that a fashion thing? Is that an aesthetic thing? Well, actually, if you do a little studying, it was a functional thing that started with sailors hundreds of years ago where they, on the top of their hats, they'd put those baubles because when they're at sea and their water gets rough, sometimes they'd be prone to hit their heads and it would create a little bit of cushion for them when they'd hit their heads on the ship. Or, or what about, anybody ever wondered why there's holes in the caps of pens? Anybody here an avid pen chewer at all? If you are, those holes exist for you. Because they've learned that people, this happens more than you'd imagine, actually swallow those pen caps. And that little hole in the pen cap is there to prevent you from losing all oxygen through your airway. Okay? So you can thank God for that next time you're chewing on your pen. Or those tiny pockets in your jeans. I mean, those puzzling petite pockets. Why are those there? Well, they actually are there to carry 
Pocket watches, some of you know this. Jeans were created in 1873 and a pocket watch was like an essential accessory back then. And so they've kept the mini pocket since 1873 to be part of a lot of the jeans that you probably wear. Now here's why I bring this up. Because when you know what something is for, you can make sense of how you should use it. And if that's true of something as mundane as jeans or a pen cap or a hat, I think it's also true for something as wonderful as your body. When you know what your body is for, you can make sense of then, how do I use this body? And then here's another step. When you know who your body is for, then you know, here's how I should use it. And I think today what you're gonna discover is that your body is for someone that the world doesn't tell you. First Corinthians chapter six, I'm gonna jump around this passage, but I'm gonna start at the end of verse 13. Here's what the apostle Paul says. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Let me start off, break this in two parts. Let me start off with the last part. The Lord is for your body. You ever wonder like, who really, who really has your back? Who's really for you in life? And you ever wonder who's for your body? This might sound strange to hear in church, but God is for your body. God cherishes your body. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God created your body with incredible intentionality and he cares about it still? Uh, David, uh, psalmist in Psalm 139, 14 said these words, I praise you, God, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. In other words, David's praying to God and he's saying, God, I know you are not neutral about me and you're not neutral about my body. In fact, the verse before this says, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And the language of knitting here is getting at the point that you were fashioned especially, hands-on, carefully, intentionally, lovingly. In other words, David's saying, God, I thank you. I wasn't just impersonally assembled. I wasn't just randomly assigned my body. It is a gift that you thought up and that you formed for me. It's designed and crafted for me. That, that phrase, fearfully and wonderfully made, we don't often use the phrase fearfully and wonderfully in life, but I think this goes to the idea that if you could really think about all that went into God imagining you and forming you, you would get goosebumps and your breath would be taken away. It's kind of the image, if you've ever seen a first time parent holding a newborn for the first time, there's a bit of fearfulness in them. They're thinking, this is, this is incredible. I'm holding this precious little body. And then when you see those people try to put the, the baby in the car seat in the car, it can be a challenging thing. There's reverence to that little precious body. And the same is true for you. God has reverence. He cherishes your body. He's for your body. Even though it might not have been the body that you would have picked for yourself. But in some way, this is the body that God knew you needed to be you. It's part of what makes you, you. And this can be a sensitive idea, I know, for some of us because a lot of us, we, we think, God, you wanted me and you wanted me in this body, but it's hard to believe because in our world, sometimes we, feel, we don't feel wanted by anybody. Sometimes it's easy for us to feel like, man, my life is an accident. I'm a mistake. I know sometimes that's a joke in families. Like you were, you were the accidental baby, you were the whoops baby. And we laugh about that. But friends, there's deep pain that some of you have expressed about that, that you were not planned. And what I want you to know is even though maybe your parents or someone told you you weren't planned or your body doesn't feel right, you were not an accident and God planned you. And your body is actually vital to who you are. Many times we kind of tend to assume that the real me is the soul that's inside of my body. In other words, the body I have is just like a flesh and bone container that I carry my soul around in. It's a blank canvas that I get to design my identity on. But the Bible portrays a very different picture. Scripture teaches, it does not teach that you have a body, but that it teaches that you are a body. That actually 
Your body is essential to who you are. And this comes right from the beginning in Genesis 2. If you remember, God forms Adam in a very interesting way. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. There's something striking to me about this. Listen to the order in which it's described. The, God takes the first the raw material. He takes the dust of the earth and after he forms it, he breathes into the nostrils and Adam is a living being. In other words, God animated the matter and made him a living thing. You see, scripture doesn't teach that Adam was a soul off in heaven somewhere and God said, okay, I need to find some sort of Tupperware to fit this soul in. I'll form this. No, no, no. Instead, God had the physical first and actually breathed in to make the spiritual. And those two things are connected. In the words of Sam Alberry, who, who wrote a book called What God Thinks of Your Body, incredible book, been reading it the last couple of weeks. He said this, we are not to think of ourselves as imprisoned souls, but as animated flesh, which means your body is precious to God. It's essential to who God made you to be. And, and your body has a purpose in this world. Your body is fearfully and wonderfully made. Now let's take a break for a moment and just ask, does that mean your body is perfect? No. Does that mean your body works the way you want it to? No. In fact, David, who's writing these words, he didn't have a perfect body. The more he aged, the more he realized that. He, he didn't use his body in perfect ways. He did some pretty horrendous things with his body. And David's body, he's precious, fearfully and wonderfully made, but it was broken. And friends, our bodies as well are broken. Our bodies, we live in a world that has been tainted because Adam, that one God made, and his wife Eve, they sinned. And since that world, the moment, the world has been groaning. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, and we're groaning too. We believers also groan. This is the New Living Translation. Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. You see, I think most of us, during our week, whether we realize it or not, we are groaning because our bodies experience sin and suffering. And it gets experienced in different ways. For some, it's experienced in sickness. We live in a world where our bodies don't always work the way they're supposed to. Sometimes they stay like that for a long time. Kind of, let's just, let's just level the playing field for us here. If you want to do this, you don't have to do this. In the past week, if you've taken any form of medication for your body, would you raise your hand right now? I mean, this is most of the room for those of you online. And I imagine most of you online. Why? Because even though our bodies are you know, wonderfully and fearfully made, they don't always operate perfectly. In fact, there are some who experience chronic pain in their body and it may be there for the rest of their life. And if you're wondering, John, this is so obvious. Why are you saying this? I'm saying this because there are actually false theologies out there that will tell you, well, if you're a disciple of Jesus and you obey and you're faithful, you will not experience sickness or body pain. And that is not what scripture teaches. Our bodies groan because of, of the suffering that sin has brought in this world. It's not just sickness, though. Our bodies are broken with shame. You see, since Adam and Eve sinned in, Act, in Genesis 3, third page of your Bible, Right after they sin, they realize we are naked. And the first thing they try to do is they start to cover their bodies because they felt vulnerable. They felt exposed. And many of us, we felt the same way. We felt some version of shame over our bodies. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. Sometimes it's the social pressures that we feel like my body's not right. You ever, been, you ever gone to the beach before and you're thinking, I'm not sure I want to take my shirt off today. Like, you just feel a little trepidation about like, I don't know if I, I feel like I wanna do this. Sometimes it's shame, I'm too big, I'm too skinny. I don't like, look like those airbrush models on the magazine. And, and by the way, those airbrush models don't really look like that before they're airbrushed either. Other times we feel shame, not because of how our body looks, but because of something we've done with our body. We've used body, our bodies in ways that we regret. And, and we'll come back to this in a few moments, but. Paul writes this in Romans 6. He says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. And many of us have. And sometimes in churches, we come and we feel like damaged goods, like our bodies can never be redeemed, but nothing could be further from the truth. God is still for your body. Sometimes we feel shame not over what we've done, but over what someone else has done to our bodies. 
And one of the most awful elements of abuse is that often it's the victim who's carrying the shame after, not the perpetrator. And sometimes it can be easy for a victim to think, well, this is, this is, I'm the kind of person people do this to. This is just who I am. And again, nothing could be further from the truth. God is for your body and he doesn't want you to carry that shame. We experience brokenness and sickness and shame. One more way, I think our bodies experience brokenness that I wanna just speak to you just for a brief moment is, is, is something called gender dysphoria. Some of you, I know, you know, there's culture wars that are fought and bought and, uh, all about gender dysphoria. And I just wanna spend a couple moments just as a church to make sure we understand. What is gender dysphoria? Dysphoria is the opposite of euphoria. Euphoria is elation, excitement, joy, which means dysphoria is the opposite. It's a deep and profound uneasiness. It describes the uneasiness and distress that we feel often about our bodies, but in specific situations, some people feel that distress because they feel like my body on the outside doesn't match my identity on the inside. And friends, this is a real pain. And I know some of you here, you might be experiencing that pain and you come to church and you're like, I can't really talk about that. Or you have loved ones and you've been hurt in the church over that. And I just want you to understand gender dysphoria is a very real pain. And, and it's something that, you know, I know culture has just said, the culture's message is, well, just change your body so it feels like what the inside feels like. And then sometimes in church, churches will say, well, just pray and you'll be healed of feeling that way. But often, often there are faithful disciples of Jesus who pray and they still have that ache inside of them. And there's still that internal noise inside of them. And I want you, want you as a church to realize that as people are, are experiencing that, the church should be some of the most compassionate people because we understand why our bodies are broken because of sin. And we understand how precious people are to God. And we have this opportunity not to, to just in glib ways to say, well, God doesn't make mistakes, but instead to look at someone who God loves and, and you're supposed to love and say, God loves you and I love you. And I don't understand this all but I'm gonna walk with you as you figure out what does that look like to be faithful with your body to God, even in the difficulty. And I want you to know if you're experiencing any sort of pain with your body, I just want you to know the church, you're, you're not meant to be alone on this. The church wants to come around you. And, and if you're here and you're thinking, but John, my, here's my theology. Hey, you can have a right theology according to what you believe scripture teaches and at the same time walk beso beho beside someone who's hurting. I think that's when the church is at its best, when they're walking beside someone in their pain. So, friends, all of us, the Lord, God is for your body. God is for your broken body, even when you don't feel for your body. Even when you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, God loves you. And I think one of the biggest takeaways for me this week, and maybe for you, is just choose not to hate what God cherishes. Which leads to the second point from this verse is, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. As a disciple of Jesus, if you're trusting him, if you're putting him first, you respond to your sexuality different than the rest of the world because you believe that your body is for God. It's for the Lord. It means it's meant to be used for him, for his purposes. Your body's not for other people. Your body's not for what culture says it is. Your body's not even for yourself. It, in contrast to culture, your body is not your own personal playground. Your body has an important purpose in God's work. This is what the Apostle Paul's getting at. He gets to verse 19 in 1 Corinthians 6. Listen to what he says. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You see, Paul wanted the disciples in Corinth to understand that our bodies, they don't just belong to us anymore. Now they're owned by somebody else, which in our world can be kind of a scary thought if we're honest, because we've seen some of the most evil things perpetrated in our world where one person thinks they own somebody else. This is what's so appalling to us about human trafficking or about slavery. Just, but here's what Paul's saying is, is you shouldn't be appalled that your body belongs to God. You should feel liberated. Because here's what that means. If your body belongs to Jesus, that means he wants you and 
He's gonna, he's gonna be with you whatever you're facing and, and one day he's gonna actually redeem that body. It means he cares. And I think sometimes we struggle believing that God really cares about me and my body. There's a TV show that I'm sure none of you have ever heard of and I'm not recommending it to you called Schitt's Creek. Um, and the premise, I don't know what the laughter means, but okay. The premise of the show is that there's this rich entitled family who has lost their entire fortune. And they have nowhere to go, but then they discover that they actually own this little podunk town in the middle of nowhere that they bought as a practical joke. And so when they have nowhere else to go in the world, they end up going to this obscure town out of desperation. And friends, I wonder if that's a picture of how you think God feels about purchasing or buying you. Maybe you think, okay, maybe God owns me, but it was a practical joke. Maybe God owns me, but he would never want to actually invest or be with me. And what Paul's saying is actually, you're wrong. Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's spirit could dwell wherever he wants in the universe and he chooses to live in you. So regardless of how put together you feel today, regardless of how messed up you feel or your body feels, your body is holy real estate. Your body is God's address on earth. 12 years ago, had a chance to visit Israel and we were only on the ground for three days in Israel with this little group I was with. And so it was kind of a question like, what are we going to be able to see in three days? And one of the things I was so glad we were able to, to go and see was the Western wall in Jerusalem, the, the wailing wall that's right outside of the temple compound that dates back to the time of Jesus. And if you've been there before, you know, this is a sacred place and people go and pray. It's sacred because of its proximity to the temple mount where the, the Jewish temple was. And uh, right now, if you've been there before, you know the Temple Mount is actually administrated by a Muslim leadership uh, because of the Al-Aqsa Mosque right here. And so praying for a Christian or a Jew is, is actually not allowed on the Temple Mount. And this means the Wailing Wall right here becomes kind of the closest you can get to really pray in that sacred place. To, and so when you go there, there's people who are praying with deep longing, deep desire. There's, there's a longing. I mean, I've heard it all uh, before now, but people like kind of on the fringe sometimes are like, hey, they're building a third temple in Jerusalem. Did you know it? Like, there's longing. What if that temple could be rebuilt again? But I'll never forget as we were standing there at the Western Wall, one of my friends named Rich, he looked at a group of us and he said, here's what's amazing is that God has made your, your body more of a temple than that site will ever be. And friends, this is true about you. Not because you're perfect, not because you have it all together, but because Jesus has chosen to place his spirit in you. You were bought. And not to be part of some collection that God has in an inventory in some warehouse, not just to add to some Excel spreadsheet that someone else manages. He has bought you so he can live in you and work in you. Your body is cherished. He doesn't just tolerate you. He treasures you. The good news of the gospel, friends, is that Jesus, he took on a body. Now, what's crazy about this is Jesus didn't just take on a body for like 33 years, and I'm so glad to get out of this thing. Jesus took on a body and he will carry a body for the rest of eternity. He took on a body like us so that his body could be broken so that our bodies could be bought and then one day our bodies could be healed and become like him. And this is what it means when you're bought. That means you're that precious. Even when you look at the mirror and hate your own body, God looks at you and cherishes you. And you should, you should take care of your body too and cherish it because God cares about it. Paul in, in Ephesians chapter six, he's, he's talking about husbands and wives and he says this interesting comment. He says, in the, same way, I, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. That little statement, no one ever hated their own body, I think there's a bit of hyperbole here because I think there are, we could all say, I didn't like my body on that day and I don't like my body over this. And, but I think what Paul's getting at is this, is the idea that when your body's hungry, you wanna feed it. And when your body's injured, you want it to be treated. You want to take care of your body because this, this is, kind of matters to you. And what Paul's saying, hey, if, 
if your body doesn't just matter to you, but it's actually owned by God, how much better care of it should you take? How much more attention should you actually pay to this is God's temple? And sometimes even in the, in the, in the spirit of, well, I'm gonna serve you, God, we abuse our bodies in ways we shouldn't. Uh, there was a, a productive young preacher in Scotland named Robert Murray McShane who had a very, very you know, successful ministry, lots of things happening. But sadly, in his ministry, uh, his preaching was connected to an unhealthy pace and exhaustion. And that unhealthy pace and exhaustion contributed to his premature death at age 29. And on his deathbed, it's reported that this is what McShane said. The Lord gave me a horse to ride, his horse being his body, and a message to deliver, the message being the gospel. Alas, I have killed the horse and cannot deliver the message. Had he taken better care of his body, he might have had many more years to actually preach the gospel. Friends, it is not unspiritual to think about your health. It is not unspiritual to exercise, to work on getting good sleep, to eating the right things for your body. Because when your physical health is is bad, it takes a toll on what God might want to do in you if you have have the ability to work on that. So nourish your body, take care of your body. God's for it, it's for God. But one of the most important things, and this is kind of either where we're going to turn toward the end to get back to where we started, is if, if your body's bought by God, you need to offer your body back to God. Now, again, I already said you belong to him. He bought you. So that means the only person truly in this world who needs to be pleased by your body is God. So how do you please God with your body? Is it to make sure it turns heads at the beach? Is it to make sure it looks like the billboard? Like, how do you please God with your body? Romans chapter 12, verse one says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true pauper worship. Some of you, you know this verse, but for 11 chapters before this, Paul has been writing about, hey, here's what it means that God takes us in our sin and our rebellion and our lostness and actually saves us. He makes a way by his grace and mercy. And after explaining that for 11 chapters, he gets to chapter 12 and says, okay, here's your response for being extended that grace and mercy. Offer your body to him. Offer your whole selves to him. Everything. Don't hold any part of your life back from him because no matter how you feel about yourself, Jesus wants all of you. But, but notice, the, the offering is put in bodily terms. And you can make a choice, every one of us, do I offer my body to God or do I offer my body to really a sinful agenda in my life? In Romans chapter six, this offer language goes, comes out. It says, do not offer any part of your sin, yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. You see, we're, when we're con- not connected to Jesus, our tendency is to use parts of our being for our own selfish desires. Sometimes we're not even intentionally doing it, but we use our body and we use our being for our own sinful desires. In Romans 3, Paul describes this. He says, there's no one who does good, not even one. And then listen to the bodily language. He says, their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. If you see the quotation marks, it's because he's just taking sections of the Old Testament to show this. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Ruin and misery. You know, this is, do, do you hear the physicality of this here? Paul is saying that our life, our life before knowing and being changed by the grace of God, it's, it's often about using our bodies for sinful, selfish desires. But when you're brought from death to life, now we offer every part of ourselves as an instrument of righteousness. That means, God, I'm not gonna use my body for sin's agenda. I wanna use it for your agenda. Can can you think of how that would affect every part of your body? John Stott puts it like this. He said, well, your feet would walk in his paths and your lips would speak truth and spread the gospel and your tongues would bring healing to hurting people and your your hands would lift up those who have fallen and you'd probably perform a lot of mundane tasks as well like cooking and cleaning and typing and mending to serve people. Your arms would embrace the lonely and unloved. Your ears would listen 
to the cries of the distressed and your eyes would look humbly and patiently towards God. And of course, of course, part of offering your bodies to God would to offer your sexuality to God. And here's what that means, to say to God, God, how can I use the sexual energy that you've given me in a way that honors you and dignifies other people? That means, that means as disciples of Jesus, you and I are called not to be sexually active outside of the marriage covenant with your husband or your wife. That means if you're married, you're sexually active with only your spouse, your husband or your wife, but you take a posture of cherishing and serving your spouse, not taking from your spouse. That means whether you're married or you're unmarried, your passions and desires are not what drives you. It's your devotion to Jesus. That means when you have that shame and guilt over things you've done in the past or maybe things you struggle with today, you do not let that define you. Instead, you are defined by the fact that God is for your body and your body is for him. You are his temple. And I know, I know this can be a painful thing for a lot of us because when we talk about this idea of sexual immorality, that word immorality is actually a word that means kind of selling yourself off. It, it can be a, 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 just a hard thing to think about the ways that, God, I didn't use my body in ways that honored you in the past. Or I'm, I feel pain over ways others have used me. And I just want to remind you, when you offer yourself to God, you're doing it in view of his mercy. You're doing it in, in view of his grace. You're doing it not in this place of God's so ashamed of the things that have happened in your past, Instead, you're doing it from this place of Jesus was so intent on having you, having a relationship with you, that he took on a body and he went to a cross where he died. His hands were nailed so your, your whole body would one day be healed. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, some of you know this, remember this? We say it every time we take communion. Jesus took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. This is my body offered for you. Jesus was taking a perfect body, perfect, not tainted by sin, and he was allowing it to be broken, offered for you. And now here's your response, church. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, what you say is, Jesus, here's my broken body. It's broken because of my sin. It's broken because of others' sin. But Jesus, if you're willing to offer me your body, I'm gonna offer you my broken body. And what's so amazing is Jesus' broken body is what can put you back together again. And spiritually speaking, that's what God does when we accept the grace that he offers. And then one day, there's a promise that your body will be redeemed and it will become like Jesus's and it will be made perfect and there will be no more sickness or crying or death or pain. But in the middle of this right now, it can be painful. And so may you be reminded, God is for your body and your body is for him. So give it all to him. And right now I wanna give you a chance to do that. Would you pray with me? <laughs> Father, Father, we thank you that there is nothing we could ever do that would cause us to not be desired by you. God, we thank you that you sent Jesus in a body to save us. And right now we, we offer ourselves to you. And just with your head bowed, your eyes closed, this is between you and God. If today is a day where you say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I wanna offer him my body. Just tell him, God, I, I give you my body. Part of me doesn't know why you want it, but I give it to you. Would you forgive me of my past? Would you put your spirit inside of me so I could be your temple? God, I want my body and my life to be an instrument for you. God, I pray that would be true for every single one of us. And as your Holy Spirit works through us and in us, they would experience your love and grace and goodness, and they would realize what they're here for too in this world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Friends, if you need prayer, there's gonna be a team at the front of the auditorium and online who would love to pray for you. And I uh, hope you see you next week. God bless you.